Welcome to the new world of work. Uh, I'm Adi Ignatius, Editor-in-Chief of Harvard Business Review. And each week on this show, I sit down with a top-tier CEO to talk about how the workplace is changing. This is a reset moment for a lot of us. So we want to hear from um, people on the front line, people who are leading companies for to hear about their experiments, what they're learning around the world to figure out how do we how do we interact, how do we how do we work together, how do we collaborate, how do we innovate as the workplace is changing. Um, before we go further, I want to give a shout out to our sponsor. Uh, Unisys is an IT company that builds business critical solutions trusted by demanding businesses and governments around the world. They partner with clients to enable cloud transformation, protect critical operations, and empower the modern workforce. Visit unisys.com to learn more. So our guest today is Paul Hudson, who's the CEO of Sanofi, the Paris-based pharmaceutical giant. He previously served as CEO of Novartis Pharmaceuticals, and before that, before that held senior jobs in two other pharma companies, AstraZeneca and GlaxoSmithKline. I want to talk with Paul today about a couple of big topics, health safety in the workplace, and what good leadership looks like in this new era. I also want to invite our viewers to pose their own questions for Paul in the chat box. I'll try to get to as many of those as I can mm -hmm. later in the show. And lastly, we have a newsletter. If you're an HBR subscriber, head to hbr.org slash newsletters to sign up for the new world of work. An email newsletter will, I will offer an inside look um, each week at these interviews. Uh, so with that, I want to welcome uh, Paul Hudson to the show. Hey, Addy. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you. Uh, one thing I didn't mention, Paul is a big Manchester United fan. Huh? Luckily for Paul, I can't trash talk him because I do not know a thing about English soccer, English football. But man, losing to Liverpool and Manchester City at home, that's got to hurt, right? Well, you know, that's a hard start. That's not in any briefing document. <laughs> yeah, it's a tough spell. But I'm also an Eagles fan, so I know what it feels like. So hopefully as uh, we get deeper into the season, we'll put a few wins together. You never know. We might surprise everybody. Okay. All right. Well, we'll hold you to that. So, so let's start with, I, I want to talk about a lot of things today, but let's start with workplace safety. I mean, particularly since you're uh, representing Santa Fe, um, you know, in the U S more and more companies are requiring vaccination as, uh, as a condition for employment for many workers, the deadline, are they going to, they're going to get vaxxed or not is fast approaching. I'd love to get your view on more broadly on, you know, what, what should a healthy office environment look like, you know, now and, and going forward? You know, it's an excellent question. A lot of people are really trying to answer that. You know, we're a scientific organization, we're a healthcare company, we're a vaccine company. So, you know, for us, perhaps even more than many, we look critically at all of the data. And uh, as we do that, we recommend and urge everybody in the company and outside the company too, friends, family and beyond to just simply get vaccinated. It's the best route you can take. So. We have been uh, very encouraging right across our entire global organization. We recognize that guidance and laws and different things are slightly different depending on the country. Uh, but if you have the chance, get vaccinated. That makes for the very safest uh, workplace possible. And that's exactly where we would start. And, and just, just for clarity, so that everyone understands where Santa Fe is and all this, where, where do you stand now in terms of producing COVID vaccines with, with partners or, you know, where are you now with all that? Yeah, you know, we've been on this since January, even before the WHO declared a pandemic in January 2020. And we've been uh, pushing really hard to bring a vaccine through. It'll be a booster, get data in December. We've been uh, running an mRNA program, and we've been making up to half a billion doses for J&J, &J, uh, Moderna, and uh, Pfizer-BioNTech. So we've been all in as a vaccine company, as a purpose-driven healthcare company. And to be honest, you know, our people really haven't stopped since this thing started, and nor will they, in fact, until uh, we're back to normal. And let me just push you a little bit more on this, um, this question of what does a safe, a healthy office environment look like? Um, I mean, I suspect this may not be the last time that we talk about how to protect ourselves from, from you know, things like COVID. I, I hope it's the last yeah. time. It may not be. Um, you talked about the need for vaccination. But, you know, beyond that, what, what are we learning about what a healthy office is what what are the mandates that companies need to make what do, what do individuals need to do what do teams need to do you mean for, for literally health and safety or because we go beyond that right to uh to 
resiliency and uh, protecting our people mentally, which is a, a, an even bigger subject. You know, we're, we're committed, like I said, to firstly, get vaccinated. Secondly, take all the best precautions you can in office environment. Once you get beyond that, you start looking at how to operate. And I, I think we all remember, you know, as we all switched to Zoom early on, we demonstrated we could, you know, we could operate remotely, but could we collaborate? Could we innovate? Now, we'll find out later whether, because our innovation cycles along, whether we managed to do that. But the collaboration piece we missed, and that little bit of in the corridor between meetings, that little bit of water cooler serendipity, and it's not just for the opportunities that come with it, but let's be honest, it's also to take a moment to check in with each other. How are you doing? You look a bit tired. How are you doing? I know you should quiet in the meeting. You know, you don't set up a Zoom to debrief how somebody's feeling after a Zoom. Maybe we should. But I think what's really interesting for us is how we create those moments as people start coming back in the hybrid mode to be more empathetic, more understanding, more caring. We got glimpses into people's lives through Zoom. You know, the dog jumping on the desk, the child clamoring for a parent's attention. And we shouldn't just flip straight back. When we get into the hybrid, let's care just as much. I think it's going to be important for people's physical wellness, mental wellness, and to deliver on the, the uh, growth agenda and strategies of our company and other companies too. So, so where are you in this? So you're, you're in Paris, you're presumably at headquarters. Are you, how many days a week are you having people come in? Can people choose what days they come in? I mean, yeah, what, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, for me, during most of the pandemic, I, I moved to Paris in the summer of 19. And I remember saying to, to my family, I don't really need a home office because I'm going to be at the office and traveling. And then just a few months later, I'm working from the kitchen table um, and, and being told my voice is too loud and I'm in the way. And, you know, we were all there, had three teenagers or slightly older competing for Wi Fi. It was not the easiest moment. So I started coming back a little bit earlier. We kept our offices open for people, some people in very small apartments who needed a bit of space to get out and come uh, somewhere to go. So we did all that. Um, but I'm back pretty much every day. But our expectation is people uh, do two, three, four days, whatever feels right for them, their own circumstances. And we just touched on it in the previous answer. I think you do have to create an environment where you can catch up with each other. 100% remote doesn't give you that. So we're going to learn, right? As of now, nobody really has the full picture, the full answer, but we feel good about where we're at. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. I, I, I think those um, unplanned encounters are not only nurturing, but but probably generate ideas and 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 you know learning from one another. It's not always hard to uh, convince people of that, though. I mean, it, it, it strikes people more as a, a kind of a belief or a bias. It's, it's not demonstrable that if you're in the office, something beneficial will happen. Because we've seen that productivity is fine for knowledge workers working at home, maybe even you know, on the rise. So yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure to be 100%, because um, there are some roles that are much easier to help, You know, whether you're working in a very transactional role where your productivity is measured by, say, a ticket solved if you're on a help desk or something that has got a, a very definite proof point at the end of a day or a week or a month. I think in, in relationship-led industries, scientific-led industries, where that serendipity uh, creates a lot in terms of a, a high-performing environment, a caring environment, scientifically innovative environment, you know, you can't take away that chance. You just can't do it. And, and I've heard what you've said before from other people, but it's funny when people start coming back for the first time and you run into them in a corridor, they're literally light up with enthusiasm because they haven't seen many people, different faces. They've now working with colleagues that they've never met in person before. It's really fascinating to see how quickly the energy comes back and indeed what that brings to them. So it, it's intangible. I'm with yep. you. But so to, it's a little no, bit ahead. magical too. Sorry. Yep. So you're a, I mean, you're a multinational, a very global company. Your headquarters is Paris, but you know, I'm sure you're distributed all over the place. Um, you know, a lot of us are dealing with this question of 
we used to think of culture as something that sort of happened in the office, happened you know at headquarters. But I'd love I'd love to hear you talk about I guess two things. One, having a distributed workforce, probably ca- across countries, across languages. Um, but then also now in a hybrid environment where sometimes you're there, sometimes you're not. What are you learning about, you know, what does it mean then? How do you drive culture? How do you sustain culture? How do you make sure it works for people in headquarters, people who aren't? You know, I think, you know, the remote worker maybe a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, was always on the periphery when they connected to a meeting and almost second class. I think we've proven that that is just simply not the case. I think we think the blend, the hybrid is the right way, but you can't exclude the remote uh, person dialing into a meeting. So uh, I think it puts a much higher burden on the people in the room and the technology and the tools that we have to make sure that people are included. So for me, for example, if I'm leading a meeting and it's a hybrid, I have to really listen to the people in the room, of course. I have to make sure that the microphones are good, the cameras are good, and I have to make sure that those uh, that are remote get invited into that dialogue, You know, which means a slightly different operating model for anybody chairing a meeting, but a really essential one, because you can't create a two-tier. When you weren't there, you were remote. Not possible. So there's a very high expectation on all of us as managers and leaders to firstly make sure that everybody is included, wherever they, however they connect in person or not. So to some extent, that's a te- technology challenge. And I, I'd be interested, what have you learned in terms of, I, I don't know, uh, upgrades of technology or better uses of technology? Um, it, you know, in my experience, Zoom meetings work quite well. In-person meetings work quite well. It's what you were just talking about, the kind of hybrid meeting that can, yeah. can really fall short uh, either way, but I think they're technological solutions. We just yeah. have to figure out what they are. I, I think we're all upgrading our tech. If you're in the tech business, it's probably going to be a good windfall for you over the next year or two, because you know what was passable is no longer acceptable, and we have to be much more inclusive. You know, you have to be able to really be able to read somebody's body language from a remote connection, and and that's okay, right? Um, but it's just a higher burden on it, and we have to solve it again. Whoever's leading the meeting needs to be much more open and connected to do that. You know, we're moving into a new office next year here in Paris. There are no offices. It's only collaboration space, and it will have the latest tech. We've gone to great lengths to make sure that whether you're in the room or outside the room, you'll get the same experience. And that's going to be the minimum standard now, right? That's that's the ticket. And we want people to be you know, in our company that can manage that tech and care about the people that work for them, not two tier. We talked a couple of weeks ago with Satya Nadella, who started talking about you know, Microsoft's thoughts on the metaverse. Mark Zuckerberg is you know, renamed Facebook Meta and is talking about the metaverse where we really sort of combine, I guess, physical and virtual worlds with artificial reality and virtual reality and holograms and whatever. Is that, are you looking at you know, some companies are already experimenting with this. Are you looking at any kind of meta type uh, solution to these issues? You know, um, I'd be over the tip of my skis if I said <laughs> I was an expert in that. But, but I, but I do know that I think when we have something viable, we'll all be moving to it much faster. Particularly if it bridges the hybrid. You can imagine a world where you're sort of um, seeing data representation real time represented whether you're remote or in the room exactly the same and you can explore it and move around it. I think we're a little ways off, frankly. Um, I think if we just get it right on the hybrid up front, we get people back. People are enjoying being back physically. They don't need to be here five days a week. You know, we're a company that's in a transformation of its own. Uh, you know, last time we spoke, I was explaining to you that we'd, we'd launched a new strategy and then before we knew it, uh, everybody was remote. And yet we've continued to advance our agenda. I think we've demonstrated as a company, but also many companies, that you can continue to move even if you're trying to blend these new approaches. And and it's not a bad thing. It's really not a bad thing. You know, once you get beyond the tragedy of the pandemic, there's some things that really must stay in how we work. And, And we're trying to be at the forefront of that. But I have to ask, this is you. This is not a hologram of you, right? For now, it's just me. So, you know, I'll take it. But I will be honest, there are days where three of me would have been useful. I'm not sure everybody would have enjoyed that, but, uh, uh, but it, may have, uh, it may have helped me a little bit. So I, I want to go back. You talked about how you're building a new headquarters, which is giving you a chance to 
you know, quite literally design the future of work. Um, and you mentioned already there won't be offices. To talk more about, I guess, what is what is the what is what should future offices look like? I assume you're having conversations all the time and are, are actually planning it out. So to talk more about how you think we'll we'll come together and collaborate together in the future. Well, I think you know we learned this through the pandemic. I think that you that you can operate remotely. We demonstrated that you can transact, you can do the things, but getting to um, uh, you need to create a space that people a want to go to. You're not coming to put your stuff in a cubby and then sit at your desk and only come out to talk to people when you need a coffee. We're trying to move to a model um, across the world, but it will take time, where you um, you go to collaborate. You overlap on days that are important where um, a cross-functional meeting could take place or a staff meeting could take place because we want uh, the serendipity. Now, we know that people traditionally came in, let's say, 9 to 5, 9 to 6, something like that maybe later. Now we recognize people will come a little bit less, but may stay longer. So how you, what you offer in terms of places to linger, to chat, to bump into each other, to be comfortable, to have informal conversations, those, there's more pressure to have those spaces, you know, and rightly so. The food and uh, beverage offerings have to move to grazing all day and into the early evening. You know, it has to take a wellness uh, emphasis. Um, you know, I, th I think we just recognize that that you can't just getting people to the office to sit on their own is not the point. Um, getting people to be together, to collaborate and innovate and to keep an eye on each other in a very positive way is a duty of care and is the future of work. So a lot of this strikes me as a, a, a growing attentiveness to what workers actually need. You know, instead of saying these are the rules and follow them, or you can't work here, it's all right. I'm I'm listening to you, and and we understand more about whatever it is, work-life balance, or just things that workers need. So I, I want to then ask you. I mean, it does seem like workers are more empowered. I mean, certainly in the U.S., they have greater choice. Um, and uh, I, I guess I'd love to, your thoughts on how do you how do you retain top talent now? How do you have a competitive advantage versus your competitors in terms of, of keeping top talent at your company? You know, I think you have to, you know, there's going to be the new blend is going to be a little bit between productivity, a little bit between engagement, a little bit between flexibility, you know, and this whole ideate, uh, create, uh, you know, there's a lot of buzzwords, but I think the truth is, um, um, and in particular for talent and, and uh, talent earlier in their career, they expect a few things, right? They expect uh, to uh, tell you exactly what they think on any given day. They expect their manager to have a much higher degree of empathy and, and EQ than perhaps previously. I said earlier, we've glimpsed into people's lives and, you know, on Zoom, and we shouldn't go back to not caring. You know, I, I, I worked with an amazing uh, HR leader a few years ago, I do with one now actually, but years ago, who said to me once, she, she described herself in a big room, she introduced herself, and one of the words she used to describe herself was caring. And somebody said to her um, afterwards, you know, please don't use the word caring in this company, and that's not what we stand for. Now, that's not Sanofi, that's another company. But I think, you know, in the new world, it's a minimum expectation. You know, we may not be your, your family, literally, but we do care for you to be the best version of yourself and to want to dedicate precious years of your important, you know, of your career with us, it has to be a place where you can be the best version of yourself. It has to be where a boss that listens and understands if you're having a bad day or a great day, knows how to celebrate, knows how to help you if you're struggling. And particularly earlier, you know, with this whole data revolution, Addy, there are, you know, we're used to my generation, we grew up, we did most of the jobs on our way to hire roles in the company. So we sort of knew how to do everything. The younger talent now is uh, digitally native, data literate. Their expectation of educating the, the, the tenured like me uh, isn't by passing it up the chain. Their expectation is to be in the room with us. We didn't do those jobs. They want to tell us how the world will look. And I'm, I'm sort of pleased, right? It's this cultural and company disruption. So we have to create an environment where we're empathetic, where we listen, where we care, where we let people who are the new sort of knowledge champions step forward and have their moments and accelerate 
and create new career paths. You know, this whole, the longer you're here, you know, the higher you go is, is, is pretty much gone. And I, I think it's good that we're going to see it all with fresh eyes. And, and the talent, if it's asking for all of that, and it's asking to work in a purpose-driven company. And it's saying, if I don't connect with why I'm here and gifting you precious years of my career, then I'm not staying. So uh, personally, I think it's refreshing. I love it. And, you know, our own company is benefiting and moving at high speed. But but the, there'll be those that get that wrong, I think. Well, so yeah, so, so what, what's your advice? I mean, the, the, the definition of effective leadership is, you know, it's kind of changing under our feet. And hopefully it's all positive, progressive, you know, leads to great things. But pretty dramatic change from, I don't know, you know, 10 years ago, what we sort of thought about, about leadership and, and the role of leaders vis-a-vis -vis their teams. Um, yeah. what, what's your advice, you know, to, to be an effective leader in this new world, what do you need to do? Well, I think if you're a senior leader, you've probably missed some of the data literacy that you would have got earlier and, uh, or that it wasn't around. You've got to go and teach yourself and work with people to get up to speed. You may never compete with those that are just joining, but you should at least understand enough to create an environment where they can excel and express themselves, you know, for sure. Um, uh, you know, I, I think it's really important that we just recognize that we don't have all the answers. And our job is to create uh, environments in meetings or beyond where people can bring um, the answers in the room, and that's great. So it's in the room. Now we've got to make sure we get it out so that we can do something with it. And I, I find that really exhilarating, you know. And for me, you know, there's a lot of talk of DNI. There's not enough practice. So we're looking at how we're more representative of society like everybody else. But I really care that when we look around that room and the answers in it, that it's more likely to be in it because you know, we've got the right mix of skills and personalities and ethnicities and um, abilities and disabilities. We've got it all. And I think I think it's what's it's the minimum expectation uh, going forward. I got to share one story with you because I don't know how long we have left, but I got to share one thing with you about, about leaders doing the right thing. Yesterday, I had a long session with our head of consumer health, Julie, and our operating team, leadership team, and the whole team in Vietnam on a manufacturing site. He said, why would you share this from Vietnam? The pandemic came very late to Vietnam. And so it's only this summer where there's nearly a million cases and tragically uh, 25,000 people have passed away. Um, but what happened was, unlike many places, they, they, you had to stay home and you couldn't go out even to buy food. So what that meant was the army were delivering food. Now, if you're making essential medicines like we were in Vietnam uh, for Asia, it meant that our people had a choice, stay home, or help the patients that needed the medicines. 300 of our people, 300 volunteered to go to the manufacturing site and sleep in tents so that they could continue the production of medicines so that patients could get them throughout the pandemic. Now, that in itself, I'm sure there's many examples, but here's the thing. If you're a caring leader and our leader on the site, he installed Wi-Fi routers so people could talk to their family every evening on FaceTime, they uh, trained somebody to cut hair. It sounds like a crazy thing, but people were there for six weeks. You know, they did everything to make it feel like as homely as possible. It's a small thing. There's no policy you can write as a company for those things. You need leaders that understand if your people want to step up, you'll create an inclusive environment. You'll make the changes. You'll feel empowered. And, and you'll lead with some courage because it's the right thing to do. I'm proud as... You can't imagine how proud I am of, of that team for what they did and how selfless they were. You know, and they reflect many in Sanofi. We had 20,000 manufacturing and R&D people who just wouldn't stay home, who wanted to keep going through the crisis to help people. And they're just a small example, but we have to think about the whole person now, wherever they are. And as leaders, it's on us, and we've got to step up. Yeah, that's a great example of... of, of of good leadership, of adaptive leadership. I, I want to go to a question from uh, a viewer. This is Megan from Brighton, England. Um, so, you know, if you were ex to expect one, um, uh, I don't know, trend to emerge from uh, in business moving forward in this new kind of reset of what leadership is, and she says, for example, sympathetic leadership, what would it be? You know, what's the, what's the defining trend then of this moment 
um, for leaders? I think uh, I think it's uh, if if you were considering whether you were authentic or not, you know, challenge yourself and sit back and listen a bit more to people, understand them as a person. And there, everybody wants to be the best version of themselves. It's you know, it's a lot of slogans, like I said, but you know, the, there's some real talent everywhere, um, and it comes in all forms and shapes and sizes. And we just need, as leaders and managers, to stop running at 100 miles an hour, catch a breath, help people take a pause, help people be the best version of themselves. And on on the Zoom world, we stripped it back a little bit, I think, and I would hope that we still made those efforts you know, beyond uh, beyond the you're on mute and all the other funny moments, right? Um, there was still some tremendous moments of really wanting your people to be in good shape. And I think that that has to stay with us. It's not easy, you know, and for us at Sanofi, we're very proud of the progress, incredible progress. You know, we launched drugs for, uh, sorry, uh, research projects in MS and breast cancer, many different things during the pandemic, faster than we've ever done before. But I think one of the reasons was our people just got reunited with their purpose. And when you really are driven and you're purpose driven, you find a way and you help as many people as you lead. And I just think, I think there's something in that. And, uh, and uh, you know, I'll do my best to stay honest to that every day. I'm sure there'll be days I'm better at it than others, but, but I really believe it's a huge opportunity. So we've probably got time for a couple more questions. And I, I want to follow up. You talked about authenticity, and we've talked a bit about vulnerability. Um, I, I'd love to hear if you're willing to share sort of a moment in your career that was a crucible or, or a turning point or something like that, and maybe maybe even during the pandemic, but where you know you had to uh, adapt to something to uh, to really become the leader you are today. Oh, you know, I got to be honest, you know, and it's not me trying to be humble. I'm, I'm a work in progress. So, you know, I'm learning every day. And I, I took a new job in a new country and a new language um, in many new uh, disease areas, you know, and then went into, uh, you know, my first pandemic. So I've made more mistakes than you could possibly imagine. I've tried to fix the ones I can quickly and I've tried to to do the right thing and, I and uh, you know, to get us back on to that. And, and it was a lot, right? It was a lot, but I've I've tried to just steer a true course for myself that's consistent with my values, and I think that uh, that uh, you know nothing special, just trying to do the right thing, and 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 create that environment for others. So no, I made a ton of mistakes, made some good decisions too, thankfully along that journey. We've had some tough moments. We got stretched with our own vaccine development in COVID, but we're still here. We get data in December. But all people are very determined. And we're doing things that have never been done before. It's speeds that have never been done before. Um, I don't have any regrets. Maybe my French didn't advance as much as it could have done in the lockdown. Um, you know, we spent too many months locked in our own apartment. Um, uh, but, you know, uh, I'm trying. I'm trying really hard. And I think uh, the first thing we need to think about as leaders is a little bit of honesty about what we're not good at. Well, the French are famously forgiving about bad French, so I'm sure you're doing just fine. Hey, well, I don't know what you're referring to, but they're very gracious with me, I can <laughs> tell you. But, I, but I, you know, I try and wish people a good weekend, and then I'm getting to the stage where I can ask them what they did at the weekend and how that went. But it ties us back to where we were, right? You know, I'm a, a chief executive in, in a country where I'm not fluent in the language, so, but I have to make the effort to pick up on the social signals to see if people are doing okay. And I think that's my responsibility. I don't think I can delegate that. So one more question for you, Paul. And this it was actually teed up by a viewer uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we just decided to ask it of our guests every week. And that is, you know, what to you, what is the most essential uh, uh, aspect to innovation? You know, well, you know, in our industry, you know, yeah, you, you have to create an environment where a medicine can be a miracle. It must be first, it must be the best, it must change and transform or save a patient's life. So, you know, the only way to be rewarded by society and to be respected for the work we do, which is noble, is literally to do something that's never been done before. You know, in 2017, 60 plus percent of our medicines had the, that criteria. Today, 89 percent of our medicines have that criteria. So I got nine in 10 chances of actually doing something for a patient that's never been done before. And this company, you know, that's what we stand for. And that's pretty incredible. 
And so if uh, so, innovation is about creating the right environment, uh, letting everybody have uh, air their opportunities to speak. It's not about hierarchy. Setting a high bar on what innovation should look like, should be rewarded, and should be, um, uh, you know, a minimum is to change or save a human life. And, uh, and don't waver. You just can't waver on that. In our industry, that's what we're about. Uh, over time, we'll involve data and other things to make the chances of that happening even more realistic. But, but I can tell you, and maybe as we draw to an end, you know, we had 10 drugs, candidate drugs for oncology diseases like breast cancer, et cetera, and immunology diseases uh, like uh, skin diseases, for example, and asthma. We had 10 a few years ago. And as of today, we have 32. And that continued at a massive pace during a crisis. So high bar, great standards. Don't worry about people failing as long as they tried their best. Keep supporting them. Uh, don't blink. See how far you can go. And if you're purpose-driven and you care about changing a patient's life, you'll find a way. And that's our industry. I'm sure everybody has different motivations, but that's where we stand. Yeah. So, Paul, I really appreciated this. I mean, this conversation about leadership, uh, you know, I, I, you're very much kind of the model of today's CEO. I mean, somebody who thinks about empathetic, empathetic leadership, who thinks about, you know, inclusion and equality and sustainability and all these issues. I mean, it, it, if I were interviewing, you know, Jack Welch in his heyday, it would have been a very different conversation. So anyway, thank you for, for sharing your thoughts and, and good luck with Sanofi going forward. Uh, Andy, thanks. Great to talk about it. There's no, I guess there's no right answers. We're going to learn over time, but we're certainly doing our part. And I'm, I'm loving the learning journey and trying to make the best environment we can for all people. So thanks again. Great. Well, thank you for, for sharing your insights. Um, all right. So uh, join us next week. Um, we're on. This is the New World of Work. We are on Wednesdays at 12 noon Eastern time every week. Our guest next week will be Paul Pullman, the former CEO of Unilever and the co-author with Andrew Winston of the new book, Net Positive, How Courageous Companies Thrive by Giving More Than They Take. So that's it for now. Thank you for joining us.